And they need to hear that sense of purpose and drive and that when you're knocked down, you pick yourself up. But if you, if as, if on the other hand, as a teacher, you indulge in that conversation around, woe is me, life is so difficult because my father was an alcoholic or whatever it is, you're never going to get anywhere. And maybe life is more difficult for you. Maybe it's not. I'm not even getting into that conversation. I actually don't care. Who cares? Yes, maybe somebody was racist towards you. You're going to let that ruin your life? Pick yourself up and keep going. Catherine Burblesing is the co-founder and head teacher at Michaela Community School in Inner London. After graduating from Oxford, Catherine became a school teacher and rose to prominence when she gave a speech in 2010 criticising the impact of progressive educational ideas on children's learning outcomes. Finding herself without a job anymore because of that very speech, Catherine set about co-founding her own school, and I'm at it now. It's based explicitly on more traditional educational techniques and social virtues such as gratitude and personal responsibility. Since 2010, Catherine has become one of the world's most prominent voices on education reform and has hundreds of people, including from Australia, visiting her school every year to take back lessons to apply in their own schools. She's written and edited four books, including the latest, Michaelia, The Power of Culture. And in 2021, she was appointed chair of the Social Mobility Commission here in the UK. I have to say, having had the privilege of spending some time at the school and sitting in on some classes, hearing kids enthusiastically engage, sitting up respectfully, teachers throwing extraordinary energy into it, discipline, tidiness, focus. You couldn't make this up. So I start from a place of being quite amazed by what I've seen. But Catherine, if I could start, uh, you grew up in um, Canada, in England, you traveled the world, you studied French and philosophy at Oxford. Uh, and then you went to teach in state schools. Have you always wanted to be a teacher? Is that your great passion in life? No, I don't think I knew what I wanted to do at Oxford, but then I uh, joined this group which was about uh, sending st students from Oxford into the inner city to talk to young people in schools uh, about uh, perhaps applying to Oxford or Cambridge. And so, and, and the idea was to send students who looked like them, came from their kind of backgrounds, that kind of thing. So I would go and I would talk to these kids and at the beginning they'd say, oh, I'm not applying to Oxford, Cambridge, just a bunch of snobs, etc." And by the end of me talking to them, I found that I'd changed some of their minds. And I thought, oh, well, this is really nice. I like this and I like children. I love children. And so I chose that as my career. It was astonishing in some of those classrooms. You can tell the kids that they are, they are really diverse mm. in every way, I suspect. Yeah. Everything from the home environment they've experienced as kids right through to uh, their religious practices at home yeah. or none, yeah. through to their diets, the whole bit. Yes. But they're all sitting there yes. attentively pay, yeah. you know, getting on with it. It's, it's, it, it. As I say, you couldn't make it up. But now you attended uh, or you attracted a lot of attention from the media and your then colleagues when you gave a speech at the Conservative Party conference in 2010 decrying what you called, quote, the culture of excuses yeah. in the English education system. What did you mean by culture of excuses? Yeah, well, I don't think that you say the English education system. Of course, I was speaking about that. But <clears throat> I think you find this all over, uh, all over the place. In yeah. Australia, for instance, I, I, I've seen it there myself firsthand, uh, having visited some of your schools. And I think that this is particularly the case for children from poor backgrounds, from uh, ethnic backgrounds. In particular, I saw it in Australia when uh, teachers were talking about Aboriginal children. Yeah. And um, it's just low expectations for these children and imagining yeah. that they can't really amount to very much. Uh, and well, he doesn't have a dad at home, so we're not gonna expect him to do his homework, or he lives on that council estate, or 
Um, he's just from a poor background. And so it's a bit much to expect him to turn up on time or to have his uniform on or whatever it is the standards are. You drop them because you feel bad for them. So it comes from a nice place. You know, these people are being compassionate. But what they don't understand is that their compassion is killing the child. <laughs> and I, I saw a lot of that in Australia, sadly, um, in particular directed towards Aboriginal children. I mean, I, I remember one teacher in one school saying to me that, um, well, at the end of the day, these children are going to end up in prison. So you just have some fun with them while you can before they end up in prison. And I thought, but if we taught them properly, then maybe they wouldn't end up in prison, you know? Um, I, you know, in one school I saw them, they were doing a lot of guitar playing. Well, the children weren't playing guitar. The, the teacher was playing guitar and they were all sort of singing together. And I don't have anything against singing, but we did this for a very long time. And I was saying, are there any maths lessons, any English lessons, you know? And there was none of that. And, um, and I think that sometimes uh, teachers can look at children who come from different backgrounds to their own. And this isn't just a race issue, it can also be a socioeconomic issue. And they, they sort of other the child and they see them as so different and they feel bad about their own privilege that they've come from a home with two parents or whatever it is. And then they feel bad about sort of expecting more from that child. And in the end, they let that child down because what I always say, if we give a child a detention for not doing his homework and people say, well, that's really cruel. I, I always say, you know what's cruel? Is spending your life being functionally illiterate and functionally enumerate. That's cruel. And um, it's really about understanding that if you keep your standards high for them now, they're going to be able to succeed later. Um, I, I just, I don't understand why everyone doesn't see this, but that, that, that's, you I, know. I, I'm absolutely with you. Why progressives in Australia cannot understand that that, um, that that paternalism, that, that sort of soft racism of low expectations. Yeah, that's what it is. Flies in the face of everything they say mm -hmm. they believe in. I know. It's because in the moment of making the decision of holding the line, giving the detention, ringing the parent, whatever it is, it, it feels bad. It makes you feel like you're being mean. And either you love them enough and follow through, <laughs> and you love them enough to hold them to those high standards, or you actually quite love yourself and the way you feel in that moment, and you, 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 you allow that to trump the desire, the long-term desire for the child to succeed. That's what's going on there. And people need to sort of be honest with themselves and just think, well, am I actually dropping my standards for some of these children? And um, and not do it, really. You know, you just got to force yourself. And, uh, and that's what we do here. We have the same standards for everybody, whatever your background. So, Catherine, as I walk around the school, and I see endless photographs of people like the now Prime Minister, Boris Johnson here, of members of the royal family, of outstanding sports people, of other educators, praising what you do here. I do notice one interesting one from a man who happens to be an African-American, just on the wall here, where you're saying, if you really want to serve someone else's interests, oh. you'll tell them the truth. Yes. If you just want to serve your own, you'll tell them what they want to hear. Yes. It's a pretty important philosophy for a teacher, isn't it? Yes. What's really going to serve the child? Yes. Exactly. So, um, <clears throat> well, we all know the school where um, we feel bad about uh, mocking them down on their work yeah. because they made a good effort. And so, you give them the A and you tell them it was great, even though it really isn't very good. But then what happens in the end? The child thinks he's doing really well. And then in the end, he fails all these exams and he thinks, well, why am I failing? You told me I was doing really well. I mean, for years in this country, uh, we had a whole system of, um, of national assessment where we would give these national assessment grades every year. They were utterly incomprehensible to everybody. I mean, Parents couldn't understand them, teachers couldn't understand them. And we all just, it was one, one A, one B, one C, one A, one, two A, two B, two C. And we just used to make it up. I mean, you would go in there and you'd think, well, I gave him a two B last time, so I'll give him a two C this time. I mean, you were just, you were, <coughs> honestly, it was so ridiculous. Uh, it, schools can be, a, what everyone needs when it comes to schooling is there needs to be a goal. <laughs> It's not just something that you do. That's what I find that people think 
you send your child to school and they go and they come home. You know, so often when I've said to journalists, you don't understand, schools are failing our children. And every single one of them will say to me, but our schools are fine. What do you mean? My child's okay and he's at school. And I say, how do you know? And they'll say, well, he's okay. I say, but he comes home from school. You ask him, how was your day? He says, fine. And he goes to his room. Well, <laughs> how do you know? You don't know what's going on in this classroom. You don't know the quality of the teaching. You don't know the quality of the questioning, the quality of the explanations, the quality of the homework. Does the homework actually match what they were doing in the lesson in the first place? Is it drilling them in the right things that they need to know? Is it like, you have no idea. Is it stretching them where they need to be stretched? Is it encouraging independent thought in this kind of way, but making sure that the basics are covered in another kind of way? Like there's so, I could go on for hours about the details of what makes a good teacher and what makes for good teaching. Too often people think that teaching is just something you do when you couldn't do something else. When actually it is, you know, a, a game for only the super talented, right? Well, I, I couldn't believe the energy and the drive mm. uh, and the engagement with their students mm. that I saw amongst five or six of your teachers today. Mm. It was astonishing. Mm. They must be utterly worn out at the end of, uh, end of the term, let alone the end, you know, probably the end of the day. They well, put their heart and soul into it. That's, and that's a really interesting point. Because I would say, and I know this from talking to my teachers, they are less worn out here than they were at their other schools. Fascinating. And yep. it's true that they're giving their heart and soul and they yep. absolutely love it and they love the kids and so on. Mm. But they're also not having to deal with rudeness, yeah. chat back to them, you know, uh, kids marching out of lessons, them having to bring irate parents, dealing with that. There's, there's none of that kind of friction. Mm. So emotionally, it's a lot less draining um, it's true that they give a lot, but they they do they're not as drained as they as they as they were at their other schools. I but know. teaching is tiring. There's it's no very question. tiring. I have the you know whether it's because of the disciplinary problems, which I don't blame the teachers for very mm. well. You know, some of them are to blame, but not a lot. Most of them are not. Whether it's the expectations, the report writing, and so forth put on them, I fully accept it is a very demanding profession, and one that ought to be better recognised in every way by the community. Mm. But but now back to, so you gave that speech, uh, you know, yes. you, you dared to talk about um, a, a culture of excesses and suddenly you're out on your ear, no one wants to employ you. Yes. It was quite a struggle to start the school, I'd imagine, to find yeah. the people who'd support you, the local government authorities. Who, yes. This is again this problem of who's thinking of the kids' real interests. Yes. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, education is real political football. Yeah. At the time, the Conservative Party were the ones that introduced this idea of free schools. Um, I decided that I needed to set up my own school because I just couldn't get back into the state sector um, because they wouldn't have me because I'd done the unthinkable and I'd spoken at the Conservative Party. And that really is just a no-no when it comes to education. And not that anybody says that to you, but you just kind of know that yeah. that's what's going on. That's where um, our culture works now. You know when you've yeah. been quietly cancelled. Exactly. And it's interesting because it was before cancel culture became a thing, but yeah. I was one of the earlier cancellations, as it were, you know. That's very encouraging. <laughs> there might be people out there feeling cancelled. You can survive yes, it. You can. <laughs> but it's true that it takes an enormous amount of guts mm. and determination. So for three and a half years, I worked to be able to set up the school. We had all kinds of detractors protesting, sending me horrible emails, uh, death threats, all kind of craziness. I mean, like, just you wouldn't believe it. I kept saying, You'd think we were creating, you know, building nuclear bombs. I mean, we were just trying to set up a school in the inner city to help children who are deprived. I mean, what is the problem? But they really didn't like me. One, because I'd spoken at the Conservative Party conference. Two, because of the things I was saying. So I was saying that the system wasn't good enough. And you're not allowed to criticize education. And I was doing it openly. Um, I still do it, you know. And that's because I think you criticize what you love, you know. If you're not critical, and if you don't hold the education system to high standards, then we'll all just bob along being mediocre, and we don't want that. So we set up the school eventually, but when I say there were protests, I mean there were people, when we had our first year group, 120 year seven kids, so 11 year olds here, there were people protesting outside, handing them leaflets, telling them their lives were in danger in this building because it was a health and safety uh, hazard. I mean, can you imagine? This so, building? Yeah. It's one of the best school buildings I've seen. Well, 
at the time we were、mm. doing refurbishments,、so、you、right. had to walk through a kind of tunnel、right. to get through,、mm. and of course, all the self health and safety boxes had been、mm. ticked, but they were just making up any、yeah. old nonsense.、Um, any so, in storm. In true Catherine fashion, I saw a couple of these. Uh, flyers that they were handing them. So I took the flyer, I photocopied it 120 times, and I gave it to all the children. And I said, "When you go outside and see them, you can wave it in their faces, and you can say my headmistress has already given me a copy." Oh, well <laughs> done! That was clever. It was very clever. <laughs> I'll, I'll come to、uh, silencing the critics by the all performance in a moment. But before I do, so you set up in uh, uh, 2014. You finally,、uh, you know, found a building, a council that would support you, despite that. Opposition, locally, that you talked about, but you said there's a very interesting. It's anti-progressivist in its philosophical origins. What do you mean by progressivist educational philosophy? And and just as a matter of interest, how might parents identify it? Because I think a lot of parents are confused about what's happening in schools. Yeah, no, that's very true,、um, <clears throat> and I think you know a lot of our kids come here because or in too many schools, school. I should say, rather than blanket them all, but in too many schools, yeah, yeah. Um, well, actually, I'd probably say the vast majority of schools are too progressive.、Um, there、Public、are very few. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah.、Um, there are very few schools. You have to go against the zeitgeist.、Yeah. You have to have made、uh, a firm decision to、uh, to throw out <laughs> what everyone's telling you to do. And there are a few heads out there who do that, but we are few and far between. And so that's why I say the vast majority, because the teacher training institutions, the general culture in 2022 is one of progressivism. So what do we mean by that?、Uh, advice for the parents who are watching is: when you go into the classrooms, are the desks grouped together so that the children are facing each other? So we're in a classroom right now here,、yep. and the desks are facing the front of the classroom, and the teacher would be at the front leading the learning. In other progressive classrooms, the desks are grouped together, and then the idea is that the children are the ones leading the learning, not the teacher. And then the teacher gives them a task which they get on with together, so they are leading the learning together. And the teacher might move amongst the desks, keeping them on task, as opposed to the teacher being at the front, being the figure of authority, and leading that learning. So that's one very obvious way to tell. Then there's just the values stuff, you know. When you read their website, do they talk about tradition? Do they talk about valuing、um, tra- tra- having traditional values,、uh, or do they say we're very modern? Do they talk a lot about technology? Do they talk about、um, you know children finding themselves? That's the kind of thing that they might say. They now it sounds you think well why wouldn't you want a child to find themselves? I, I'm not against that. It's just that's the phrasing that they'll use well, if you look, you're really isn't it. Yeah, so children finding themselves, children,、um, you know, being who they want to be, that kind of thing, as opposed to we're more of a traditional outfit where we believe children need to acquire knowledge and skills to succeed at life, <laughs> and we are here to teach them and guide them and lead them and look after them and love them. You know that that that's all under the traditional umbrella. The progressive umbrella is. Children need to explore for themselves. Children need to、um, be free to express themselves and to find who they are, as it were. And the thing is, some viewers might listen to that and go, "That sounds really great." The problem with progressivism is that it's so seductive because you listen to it and you think, "That's what I want as an adult. I want to be free. I want to express myself. I want to find who I am," and that's absolutely fine for an adult. <laughs> The thing is, is that children are not experts, and children need guidance. So when you take your four-year-old out to the road, you don't say, "Here's the road, go find yourself," because he'll get squashed by a car. What you do is you hold his hand, and you gradually teach him how to cross the road until eventually he's able to do it on his own. And that will take years. It takes years to get a child to the point where he can cross the road on his own. Because he has to look both ways, he has to have a sense of when the car is going to stop. He then needs to be able to get across the road in a quick and safe manner. There, there are so many skills that are involved there in crossing the road, and I have to say, most parents instinctively know not to just allow their child to be free when it comes to crossing the road. 
They don't necessarily know that when it comes to the classroom. It's the same with anything. You need children to be habituated and to be drilled in the basics so that they can then build up from that. And you scaffold them the whole time. You're there as their parent or their teacher, constantly scaffolding, helping them get to a point where yes, they are then adults and they are free to be able to succeed and fail and try again and fail again and so on. But unless they've had that, that traditional scaffolding and teaching of knowledge and skills, if that hasn't happened properly because they have been left to child-centered learning where they are leading themselves, they simply won't know as much as the child who's been in the more traditional classroom. I must say, I was just, <clears throat> I could not get over the bond between teacher and student. All eyes on the teachers. Mm. The teacher engaging with enormous energy. Yeah. And I was looking for the kid who didn't put their hand up. Yes. When it was time to answer a question or maybe. Yeah. I, I didn't. I couldn't find one. So I, I, I'm a bit. <laughs> well, there are some, but yeah. <laughs> yes, well, yes. I didn't find one today. <laughs> and it just the dynamics of it were extraordinary. So let's drill into this a bit more. Um, <clears throat> you've been going since uh, 2014. So you've got a bit of an idea of how it's working now. Yeah. Is it well, silencing really the critics? Well. What's it look like? Success. Yeah. Uh, because it's about more than just academic results. But my guess is the academic results are good. What are you seeing about the students that have been right through now? Yes. And is it silencing the critics? Oh, many of them. It has silenced. Um, there were a whole bunch of people who were very vocal before, who were protesting outside and so on. We don't get protesters anymore. So uh, in that sense, it's been a huge success. And a lot of people who are on the fence. I find um, I have a lot of people following me on Twitter. And I find I'll go to a conference, I'll be on the street, and somebody will run up to me and say, I can't say this out loud, but I just want you to know you have my support. <laughs> Um, oh, be useful if they did say it out loud. I know, but I don't. I, I don't blame them. I get mm. it. So there are. I have a lot of silent supporters and silent followers who never say anything. And I must always remind, remind myself of this because sometimes I can get uh, distracted by the the vocal minority because I do think they are a vocal minority. It's just that the minority have the power. That's the thing. They have the media outlets. They have the politicians' ears, or they are actually the politicians. Um, and so those people are, they just have so much power. It's ordinary families who, do, where they don't have any power at all, who might be supportive, but they just can't say anything. Uh, families and then teachers, ordinary teachers. We get over 600 visitors a year who come to the school. Most of those are teachers. Some of those are Australian teachers. I have, I've had Australian teachers writing to me who have never been here but saying, because I've been on some Australian news bit and you know. Yes, you have. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll be in the news and then I'll get, we'll get a couple, few emails through to the website mm. here. They get onto the school website to say, I wish there were teachers like you in Australia. You know, this is the kind of thing they say. So I know, and, and from teachers, you know, this isn't, this isn't just from families, this is from teachers. So, and, and I think sometimes families can think, oh, these teachers, why are they the way they are? What I need to let everyone know is that there are a whole load of teachers who do agree with what I'm saying. It's just they don't have a voice. They're not in positions of leadership or management in their school. There isn't much that they can do, and they're trying. But the culture, we, our book, we have two books as a school. We've written them. We've, all my teachers write a chapter about the kinds of things we've done. And you must have one when you go. And uh, the second one is called The Power of Culture. And People underestimate how much a culture in an organization affects what happens to the people in that organization. So uh, the children you saw and you said, all oh, the hands went up. That's because that's the culture. Mm. The culture is, if I know the answer, I'm putting my hand up, you yeah. know? And I'm excited about it. And the culture is one of, I want to show off how much I know, as opposed to, if I put my hand up, I'm the nerd of the class and everybody's going to laugh at me, so I don't want to be seen to be putting my hand up. That we have actively worked very hard to create a culture where the kids are really excited about learning. And that's a hard one to achieve, but, but you know, and, and it, yeah, I was about to say, well, once you've got it, but actually you then have to work at just keeping it all the time, you know? And that comes from consistency across all your teachers, uh, a consistency of approach in terms of teaching, uh, in terms of uh, expectations of the children, and in terms of behavior management. And um, that's where you see other teachers in other schools will struggle because doing it on your own 
in a classroom where the whole school isn't bought into what you're doing yeah. is very, very hard. I can understand that. So tell me, um, eight years in, you've got obviously now quite a few students who have left the school. So how have they gone in exam terms and then out into, if you like, the big wide world beyond the school? Yeah, so we only had one set of GCSE results uh, in, with our first cohort because, of course, COVID then happened. Yeah. So there's not been anything national to talk about. Uh, this will be the first year where that does happen. Um, but uh, we, you know, in terms of our Progress 8, which uh, judges the progress from when they arrive to when they leave, we were the fifth best school in the country. <laughs> right. So, so we did well, yeah. you know. Now, fifth best in an area that would normally be seen as very disadvantaged. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Where exactly. many of the children would have had a very tough start in life. Yes, yes. They didn't get the good foundations. Yes, but that's what we have to do when they arrive in year seven. A lot of it is is damage control, making sure that we get the basics into them because they haven't necessarily picked that up at primary school. And that's you're competing with some of the most expensive institutions in the world when it comes to education. Well, remember, this is progress that they've made that they're judging. Yeah. So it's not that our children, I mean, some of them are doing very well and have gone off to Oxford and Cambridge, but we have a comprehensive really? intake. You, so you've had kids here. Yeah. Yeah. What, I if, mean, you, if this school had not been here, would any of those kids who have gone to Oxford and Cambridge, gone to Oxford and Cambridge? Well, it's hard to say. I mean, <laughs> it's hard to say. It's hard um, to imagine. I mean, to be honest, it's less, I, I'm less proud of the Oxford and Cambridge kids and more proud of the kids who are in the bottom set, mm. third set, you know, the, 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 the ones who, who aren't cognitively, you know, mm. super brilliant. And they know how to bring all their equipment to school, how to sit up straight, how to have their hand up, how to be interested in learning. Mm. They know lots of Shakespeare. They are able to go to a job interview and shake your hand and look you in the eye. They're able to know their stuff and talk about it, you know. They're, they're functionally literate and... Exactly. And they're more than that. I mean, yep. you know, they get decent GCSEs. I mean, and the thing is, is that when they, when they're out in life now, you know, some of them will become hairdressers and plumbers and all sorts of, you know, different mm. jobs. But they're going to be really good at those jobs yeah. and they're going to live successful lives. Those are the ones I'm most proud of because those are often the ones that the system fails. Yeah. Whereas the really bright ones, I mean, yes, of course, are ones who went to Oxford and Cambridge. I'm proud of them. And we did a lot for them. Would they have got there or not? I don't know. It's hard to say. But the, yeah, it really is the, those other ones who, who are often given such a rough deal by the school system, <laughs> you know, because they can't make up for it. Because of the soft paternalism. Yeah, because because of all the the, of low the, expectations, the low expectations for them. I mean, yeah. it's the same for all the kids, frankly. You know, I find everywhere right. it's just too much that excuses are made for them. But when you're super bright, you can you can sort of get round that. Even if your teachers have low expectations, you've got really high expectations for yourself. Mm -hmm. So you end up working loads at home, and you, you can you can overcome that. Um, but a lot of kids can't do that. They need the support and the scaffolding from school. One of the um, the sort of soft paternalism uh, that uh, that we hear is they're not responsible for the situation that they're in. We'll excuse them. We won't raise expectations. But you actually place a lot of emphasis on individual responsibility. And if I'm reading it correctly, you think it's very important for disadvantaged kids, the very ones that we usually try and say it's not their fault. Yeah. Well, what are you driving at? Because disadvantaged children most of all need you to hold their, your standards high for them so that they gain the knowledge and the skills that they need to succeed in life. If you keep making excuses for them, then they're not going to achieve the things they need to achieve. And then what happens? I mean, you've always got to ask yourself when they leave you and they leave school, what happens to them? If they, they haven't really learned how to read properly, if they're not numerate, then how on earth are they going to succeed in life? Will they and become a victim? Well, indeed. And if you are constantly stoking that victimhood, that sense of victimhood yeah. in them, because the other thing is that, look, you can see yourself as a victim or you can see yourself as somebody who's going to succeed. And it doesn't really matter whatever background you've got. You've got to see yourself as somebody who's going to succeed because mm. you've only got one life and you've got to be able to make a success of it. And if you're somebody who sits around saying, life is so hard for me, my father was never around, life is hard for me, I'm growing up in the inner city, life is hard for me because I don't have much money. 
well, you can do that. And then one day you'll die and you can look, you'll be on your deathbed. You look back and you say, well, I couldn't really do anything with my life because I was an ethnic minority. I mean, that's just ridiculous. You have got, it doesn't matter what, you've got the cards you've got. Those are the cards you were dealt with. There's nothing you can do about those cards, but you can change the way you react to those cards. You are in control of what you do with those cards. And um, who, who are we to lower our expectations for these children and say they can't make it? Like, it, for me, it's just racism. It's straight up racism. And it's racism that I would say is directed also at poor white kids, you know. So it's not just against ethnic minorities. It's against any child who is the other. And uh, too often, the white middle classes other children who are not like them. And they, they wouldn't do it for their own children. They keep their standards high for their own children, but when it comes to other people's children, they then lower those standards because they feel that it makes them into the nicer person. Um, and actually it doesn't, it makes you into the person who lets those children down. That's a very valuable insight and, and thank you for it. Um, now to come to the more traditional approach that you've adopted, and I, I've seen it, you're teaching European literature, uh, plenty of Shakespeare. You've even praised patriotism mm. and the importance of all children, regardless of race, feeling positively connected to their British heritage. Yeah. I mean, in Australia, you get the impression a lot of kids are actually being raised. Not, I'm not blaming teachers actually for this, but culturally, we're saying to them, you're inheriting such a nightmare, suppressive, post-colonialist, That's right. uh, racist society that you ought to be ashamed of it. Don't defend it. Yeah. You're flying in the opposite direction. You're actually saying to kids with nothing <coughs> in their own heritage as British that it matters. So, so what's the value in teaching the Western canon? And what do you say to those who say that's irrelevant or, you know, you're, you're, you're making things that were bad sound good? You're instilling them with bad ideas. Yeah, and I suppose it depends on whether or not you think Shakespeare is worth reading. You know, I think he's worth reading simply for the, if only because he's been influencing literature for 400 years. You know, I mean, they say, oh, no, we need to have more black authors. Well, you know, I'm a black author. You know, I've written books, but never in a million years would I have my children be reading up my, the things I've written over Shakespeare because I haven't been influencing literature for 400 years. If the day I'd much rather comes, reading what you're reading than some of the other rubbish they're reading. Right? <laughs> well, you know. I'm, I, I'm not even judging one way or the other. The fact is that the Western canon is, a, is what schools should be about. Now, when you get to university, you know what? You can do a whole variety of different things there. I don't mind that, you know? Um, you want to look at feminist literature, black literature, all sorts of things, that's fine. And in school, I'm not saying you can't have any of that, you know? Um, we do, you know, we were just reading uh, with our six formers in, in the English A-level, we're doing Small Island, which is this wonderful story by Andrea Levy, um, uh, who writes about uh, black people coming from uh, the Caribbean to Britain um, on the Windrush and their experiences here. So it's not like we're saying no to any of that, but what we're not doing is campaigning against dead white men. And we include a lot of dead white men in what we do because um, they're part of the canon, they write beautiful things. Uh, I once had a, um, a journalist from uh, the Sunday Times, I think it was. Uh, he came here and he heard all of our children uh, reciting the poem If by Rudyard Kli yeah, Kipling. Yeah. Yeah. And he said, that's very controversial, Catherine. Are you doing it deliberately? <laughs> and I said, but it's a very beautiful poem. And not only is it a beautiful poem, it just speaks to the heart of what we're about, right? We want the children to embody those values that are in the poem if. If you can keep your head when all around lose theirs. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. If you can, you know, treat triumph and disaster as, as both the same, yeah. you know, there's so many wonderful lines in there. Yeah, mix with um, the common man. Exactly, and not and lose the common touch, yes, yeah. yeah. I mean, like, it's just, it, <laughs> We choose uh, literature according to what we think uh, will benefit them in terms of values, but also with the canon in mind, because we want them to go off and be culturally literate. So ultimately, you want them to be able to open up a broadsheet newspaper and understand all the references. You want them to be able to read a rose would smell as sweet and know what that means. You want them to understand when they hear on the radio, oh, he's a bit of a Scrooge, and you understand what they mean, yeah. you know? Because otherwise, your children, it's, it's not just about being able to decode words. Reading and being successful at reading is not just about decoding. It's about 
the cultural references that are in the text that you are reading. And there is so much reference to those dead white men, to the Western canon in the West. Look, if, if we were in China, I wouldn't be suggesting this. We'd be reading Chinese literature, yeah. right? So um, we, we, we are looking at British history. We are looking at British literature. We celebrate the Queen's birthday. We sing God Save the Queen and I Vow to Thee My Country and Jerusalem. Uh, and we do this with pride because we are all British here. And the idea that uh, white teachers should be telling brown and black children that they're not British, it's, I think it's horrifying. Uh, m my little brown and black children are just as entitled to call themselves British as any of the white children are. And, um, and we're all together as one. What our Britishness does is it brings us together because when you're in a multicultural community where some of our children are Muslim, some of them are Hindu, some of them are Sikhs, uh, some of them are Christian, we've got children from Eastern Europe, from, and when I say from, you know, they tend to be second generation, but their grandparents, uh, and sometimes their parents are from India, from Nigeria, from Ghana, from Jamaica, from all over the Caribbean. You know, the fact is that when you have all of that difference, you need something to hold you together. That's what makes a country. And that's what makes a country successful. It's what helps to make our school successful because we're all bound together by these, by the hymns that we sing, by the poetry that we recite, by the, the history that we learn, which is our history, as opposed to feeling so uncomfortable about it. Now, that doesn't mean we don't tell them the truth. You know, we don't uh, not teach them about the Atlantic slave trade. You know, we, we, we teach all the good things and the bad things that happen. But, but, this is one that comes up all the time in the destatuary movement. Yeah, horrendous. Britain kept slave for 200 years. But it was the first empire, the first culture I've, and I'm a bit of a student of history, that actually abolished it. Yes. And inconveniently, of course, the people who abolished it were extraordinarily privileged, wealthy, white, yes. largely male, and often Christian. <coughs> yes. Yes. The very people who are now supposedly responsible for all the evils in the world. Yes, that's right. So and when... then they sent out the British Navy yes. to stop other people trading in human misery. Yes. And where's the credit for them? Were those yes. sailors who died in the Royal Navy racist? Yes. So, no. <laughs> but, um, <the> old... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but you see what I'm yes. driving at. Yes. So you've got to teach the good with the bad and the bad with the good. Exactly. If well, and the learn. point is you need to just teach the facts. Yeah. You know, so yeah. they'll un learn that. So they'll, they'll know what the facts understand... are. Yes, they'll also understand that slavery was quite, was common. This wasn't just Very a, a, a white on black reality. thing. The, the, the <laughs> triangle where they went to the west coast of Africa, they purchased slaves from blacks who'd gone inland, yeah. killed off the ones that couldn't work, that had no value. Yeah. Very cruel. Mm. And brought the rest back to the coast to sell them. Yes, exactly. You know, every culture was involved in this. Yes. As Macron said in France, although it was a very interesting point, I'm paraphrasing, uh, by all means criticise your culture, but know what it is first. Yes. Yes, although it is also true that a, a lot of the, uh, you know, what, what made Britain rich came from that slave trade. And, and, that, and, and that's something that we all need to be aware yeah. of and accept, mm. and that's fine. I mean, But then you the know, British people were courageous enough to say, we're going to stop it. And that impact... Despite the wealth, yes. Yeah, but it, it had a negative impact on British wealth mm. for many decades, the yes. economists will tell you. Yes. So they willingly took on a lowering in their standard of living and in their wealth to achieve this great social end. That's, yes. we ought to know about that. Are yeah. we prepared to make those sort of sacrifices? Yes, well, I don't anyway, know. I'm, I'm, People these days don't make I'm sorry. any sacrifices on all <laughs> kinds of levels. <laughs> well, I'm guessing some of your kids would be prepared to entertain on what I sort of day, you know. It's true. <laughs> uh, our children um, understand gratitude. We teach them gratitude. Uh, we teach them not just to be grateful to their teachers, but to be grateful to their parents and to their wider families for looking after them. And um, the thing is, is that however little you have, you will always have more than somebody else. <laughs> and you you need to be grateful for that. We teach them about being grateful for the fact that we all live in Britain. You know, like it's a great country. <laughs> um, we have the rule of law, we have democracy, we have, you know, we can choose how we want to live. You can choose to be gay. You can choose to get married or not get married or do whatever it is you want. And nobody's going to hassle you for it. You know, um, it's, it's a great thing to be able to live in a country like that. When you think there are so many countries out there where, well, if you're gay, they'll push you off the top of a building, you know, um, 
And it's just, uh, it's unfortunately these days, the, um, the argument is very skewed. And some of the law, you know, the loudest voices out there um, are only critical of uh, some people, mm. namely people in the West, um, and often politicians they might be critical of who have more of a conservative point of view. Uh, people like me, they're very cr critical of because uh, I'm a traditionalist and I believe that, um, you know, I love my country. <laughs> it looks like you've got plenty of parents who agree with you. Yes. They're queuing up to get in. Yes, that's true. Although I have to say we are in the inner city. So I think a lot of them don't necessarily understand yeah. all of those kinds of details. They might just hear it's a good school, so they want to send it, their child here. Mm. I think some of them it will just be because they're living next door and they send mm. their child to the school next door. You know, not all families, of course, are uh, are engaged with their child's education and because this is the inner city. That's the other thing to remember is that these children in the inner city, too many of them do not have parents who are super engaged. Mm. And so if you as a school don't scaffold them and support them. They haven't got anybody. Well, this you know? is, yeah. But you've recently said that our obsessive resolve to talk about racism, which is endemic across the West, mm -hmm. all a lot of people want to talk about. I know. You know, you're the critical theorist who say it is the problem in the mm -hmm. world today. Uh, and you say it actually, and I'm quoting here, undermines the sense of self-worth that children can have in themselves, that they desperately need to be able to change their stars and make something better of themselves. Yeah, well, that the idea there is that if you are stoking this sense of victim in the child, mm. yep. and if you're telling him that the establishment is against him because of his color of the color of his mm. skin, it could be because of his sexuality. It could be uh, that you're telling all the girls that you know the patriarchy is going to get them. And whatever the reason is, if you're telling them that the establishment is against them, then why would they work for it? They'll just give up. Yeah, you know, there needs to be a sense of Look, there are obstacles out there. You're going to have to jump over them. So I don't tell them that there aren't any obstacles. I certainly don't talk about the details. I don't say there is racism, there is sexism. I don't talk about that at all because I know they get enough of that mm. out in the social media yeah. world and from everyone else. So I don't talk about that. I just say there are obstacles. And what are you going to do? Sit down and just think, well, I'm done for? Mm. Or are you going to pick yourself up? Are you going to keep going? You're going to get those GCSEs. You're going to get those A-levels. You're going to get to the best place that you can possibly get to. That is the attitude that you need to have. When I was told I couldn't open this school, when I had people protesting outside, we tried to open in three different places. First, we tried in Lambeth. They managed to stop us there. They, we, then we tried in Wandsworth. They stopped us there. Then we came to Brent. It took us three and a half years. Did I at any point sit down and think, oh, well, I just can't do this. I'm a victim. Or did I think, no, pick myself up each time and I kept on going. And that is what I keep telling my kids. And that is why they are hugely resilient and hugely successful. Not the only reason. I mean, obviously, they also have a great education in terms of the teachers that they have here, or the subjects they learn, the skills they learn and so on. Heroes are important. But exactly. And they need to hear that sense of purpose and drive. And that when you're knocked down, you pick yourself up. But if you, if as if, on the other hand, as a teacher, you indulge in that conversation around, woe is me, life is so difficult because my father was an alcoholic or whatever it is, you're never going to get anywhere. And maybe life is more difficult for you. Maybe it's not. I'm not even getting into that conversation. I actually don't care. Who cares? Yes, maybe somebody was racist towards you. You're going to let that ruin your life? Pick yourself up and keep going. There's a lot of talk, and you and I have talked about this before, about uh, the effect that technology is having on children, uh, the internet and uh, iPhones in particular. You actually wrote an article about it, though, since we, we talked about it, I think, uh, called Digital Detox at your school. What's yeah, so digital we have a, detox? Yeah, we have this whole digital detox system. So I bought this massive safe, and the kids are strongly encouraged to give us their phones and their devices. Yeah. Um, and we put them in the, in the safe. Yeah. They can give it to us for one night. They can yeah. give it to us from Monday to Friday. They can give it to us for the weekend. It's up to them. It's entirely voluntary. And then we keep their phones and um, we help them sort of break the addiction, as it were. Addiction. Now, yes, it is definitely an addiction. Uh, some of them don't have phones at all because before they arrive at the school, I speak to every single parent yeah. and I say to them, 
my advice is do not buy your child a smartphone mm. before they come to secondary school because that's often the time just when they start secondary school that their parent gives them a smartphone yep. we sell brick phones here yep. to the parents at a loss so we buy them for 14 we sell them at 10 um so that you can still text yep. you can still ring them you have the convenience of staying in touch with your child but they do not have unsupervised access to the internet yep. because that is so dangerous whether on a phone or on a laptop but the point about a laptop is that you'll be there with them at home you can watch them but the phone they're out and about on the street you have no idea who they're meeting meeting people in gangs girls meeting older men boys meeting all sorts of horrible people who you wouldn't want your 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 boy mixing with i mean honestly it it is a it is a genuine danger for children to be given unsupervised access to the internet and people just don't real parents don't realize yeah. they don't realize take the point um funding in australia we have almost doubled the per capita funding for children broadly speaking particularly in the state system and every expert who wants to talk about it says we've got to resource our schools better and if governments don't they're failing <coughs> but our academic standards i mean you cannot get away from the numbers they continue to decline mm-hmm. uh, anxiety depression and self harm levels are continue to rise mm-hmm. the extra money doesn't seem to be the solution well, i'm not anxiety, saying they shouldn't be well resourced but it doesn't seem to be yeah. the key ingredient well jonathan height the american he's done yeah, a great yeah. job of uh, tracking this sort of thing with yeah. um children that anxiety and depression levels have risen massively since yeah. the introduction of the smartphone the very thing you were talking about a yeah. moment ago like uh, and then your child's mental health falls apart and you don't know why and it's because you gave them a smartphone yeah. and i you know my, i'm ringing the alarm bells for parents is all i can say is do not give them a smartphone and i know it's hard because they'll say but i'm being left out of conversations yeah. i need to be in there you just need to love your child enough to hold the line um Yeah so what was the beginning of what you were saying Oh uh, funding you know we've oh, we've, funding, we've increased yeah. funding hugely but so it's done nothing to arrest declining standards yeah. and increased question problems of anxiety yeah, So I'm ahead I'm principal of a school I'll always take more money if they're going to give it to me Um and of course money will make things better in some ways but we always make the mistake of thinking that more money will uh, is how you fix the problem and You got to think well why is the problem a problem? Maybe it's because of a bad idea. Maybe it's because we're doing more of what we've always done. Um uh, maybe there's something wrong with the teacher training. Maybe there's something wrong with the discipline. Maybe there's something wrong with our expectations of the children. And then we need to go around to other schools and see well what are they doing differently? How can I take an idea from here and from over there and so on to make where I am better even though I might not have much money? That is um Yeah, that that's how we all need to think, but it's much easier to just say, "Oh, it's because we don't have the funds." Um I'd say it, it's because too often we have bad ideas. Well, I know in our country, I don't like left right right divides, but um it is true that the progressive uh, sort of elements in society, particularly in politics, talk a lot more about education, I think, than others. Uh and yet so often it's just a demand more money. or different working conditions for teachers and i have the utmost respect for teachers that's not the issue the focus is not on what yes. is going to help the children prepare for life yeah well and i think part of that is because they assume everybody's sort of doing the right things already um and that's where some humility needs to come we need to start questioning what we've always done uh and and look to others so most of the stuff that you see happening here at our school we've just taken from somewhere else. Yeah. Right? I've been to visit a school and I thought that's a great idea. Let's use that. I've been to another school, well, that's a great idea. Let's use that. And so we have adapted and changed so much in order to make sure that the offer that we're giving our children is of the highest possible quality. Um I think too often schools are just sort of considered the place where children go and they do they get babysat and they learn something. and it's all right and there's some kids who are more driven than others and that's just how it is and isn't it could there, be so much better than that isn't there an issue here that i i would have thought in this country i know in ours education is incredibly important to people who have been successful in life they will push their kids to the nth degree and they will demand an awful lot from their schools so you get that at one level but then there are the taboo subjects that people won't talk about um 
when it comes to children doing well. For example, the home environment is a great predictor of how well prepared the kid will be when they enter school and then how well they'll do through. Yes, and that's but, true. But a lot of people are not comfortable saying to parents, you know, if you're going to bring kids into the world, you shouldn't bring them into a dysfunctional environment. Yeah, well, I mean, obviously, <laughs> I think, but... But, but we don't talk things, about it. No, no one does. And politicians don't, um, because there's nothing in it for them. Why would they go and criticise families, you know, when they want their votes? So, I mean, it's not just don't bring them into dysfunctional environments. It's when you have a child, how are you going to invest in them? How are you going to make sure that you are teaching them? Yep. Whenever I say this on Twitter about teaching your own child, so many people say to me, I'm not teaching my child. That's the job of schools. Yeah. And I always think, well, OK, then your child isn't going to do that well at school, because I can tell you that at five years old, there are some children who start school already reading. Yeah. And there are some children who have no idea how to read. Mm. Now, you can say, but the school's going to teach my child. Well, I can tell you for nothing. The ones who already know how to read are at a massive head start. And then they are reading even faster and better and longer books and harder books and so on. And when they're then 12 and they're still reading and they're, they're reading books for 15 year olds and so on. And you look at them and go, gosh, it's amazing. My child never took to reading like that. Well, it was because you never taught them. That's why. Now, it, when I say teach, I don't mean stand up at home with a blackboard, you know, teaching them algebra. I mean, teach them everything, spend loads of time with them, talk to them loads, read to them loads, draw your finger under the words as you're reading to them. Don't just read them one story before they go to bed. Spend 20, 30 minutes reading to them. Um, get them to a point where they eventually can read on their own. Uh, do get, go to the shop and buy some phonics uh, support and teach them phonics. You can teach them how to read long before they go to school at five. And then, uh, when they're at school, support the school by making sure you're not just doing the homework, you're doing more than what they're asking. You're counting the peas on the plate. You're counting the, the cars on the street. Once they know how to count, you know, let's say to 50, you're then counting by twos, you're then counting by threes. And over a period of years, you learn how to count by threes, fours, five, sixes. And hey, presto, guess what? When you're doing their multiplication tables, Suddenly, it's really easy. Isn't it funny how that boy just picked up those times tables like that? Well, that's because he had a mum who was counting with him by twos, threes, and fours when he was little. And people don't think like that. They just sort of think, well, he just has a knack for maths. No, his mum helped him have that knack for maths. And those years, zero to five, long before they ever get to school, they are so crucial in determining a child's future. So a family is so important. But then my thing is the schools need to be excellent because sadly, not all children get that kind of support at home. So we try to make up for some of that as much as we can here at Makeda. Don't want to disrupt perfection. I mean, we can't finish on a better note than that. <laughs> what you've had to say has been of such interest and I think is so incredibly important. I only wish there were a whole lot more people with your drive and determination. Thank you. In your country and in mine. There are lots, but we need more. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me.